Next.js 15 just launched and it comes with a ton of amazing new features. I really like how they handled some things related to caching. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about all the different breaking changes, what you need to know to upgrade from Next.js 14 to 15 and the new features you can expect. But I first wanna start with a small story. I originally recreated a video on Next.js 15's release candidate two, because for some reason, Next.js released their release candidate two, which is like a beta version, six days before they released the full version of Next.js. They released their first release candidate like six months or five months before releasing their actual final version. So I have no idea why they waited so long to release the second beta version, only six days before they released the stable version. It really doesn't make sense, but I spent a ton of time recording and editing a video and I didn't even get to release it to you because they actually released the full version before that video even went live. So now this new video is gonna be talking all about Next.js 15, but I definitely feel the pains of JavaScript changes too fast. So here we go. On the left-hand side of my screen, I just have a fresh install of Next.js 15. This is exactly what it's going to create for you if you just use the default settings inside of Next.js. And on the right, I have the actual blog article talking about all the different changes inside of Next.js. And the one really nice thing about Next.js is that they have a code mod that makes it really easy to upgrade from Next.js 14 to 15 because they actually introduce quite a few breaking changes that require really small code changes throughout your entire code base. But you can just run this one single command. And what that's going to do is it's going to upgrade things like like the Next.js version, your React version, React hooks like ESLint versions, and it's gonna make changes within your project to make sure it conforms with some of the breaking changes. We'll go over what all those are, but this is a really nice quality of life feature. And when I tested it out, it seemed to work pretty well across quite a few different projects. Now let's scroll down here a little ways. Like I said, they have that code mod. This just makes upgrading incredibly easy. I highly recommend checking this out. And the very first big breaking change is something that I never really expected to happen. They didn't really talk a lot about this. But that is async request APIs. So normally when you got headers, cookies, params, or search params inside your application, you would just access them directly. You would say, for example, let's go into a page here. And up here, we would just say headers. Make sure I import that. And this would give me, whoops, const header values, just like this. This is how you would normally access your headers inside of Next.js, but now they changed it so that headers actually is a promise instead. Now, if you read through the actual explanation of why they did this, the main reasoning is that headers and all these other dynamic things, they require you to actually do dynamic stuff that requires a response and a request object and so on. But a lot of times your application doesn't actually need this. So if you're not using this, you don't actually care. And a lot of times you actually get this information after some of your code is already rendering, for example. So by making this an asynchronous thing that you can actually just throw in a wait on here like this, it makes it so that they can statically render more parts of your application to hopefully increase the speed of your application. So it's just a thing that helps with speed and that's pretty much it. And luckily it's a rather minor change. This is something that the code model will do automatically for you. Now, the one thing that's a little bit annoying is parameters and search params are also going to be asynchronous. So if you, for example, let's just create a brand new page inside of here. We'll call it ID, just like that. And then we'll create a page. So if we export that page and we normally, we're getting some type of parameter inside of here. So we could say params and we would type out our params to say, for example, that it's got an ID, which is a string. There we go. And inside of here, we could say ID equals params.id. Now we can no longer do this because params, again, is returning to us a promise. And of course, I need to make sure I actually do my typing for this properly. There we go. That's actually gonna type that properly. So params is returning to me a promise. Now I'm typing this manually to not be a promise, but this is going to throw an error because this is an asynchronous function. So instead, I need to type this as a promise instead, just like that. And then I could throw a simple await inside of here and that's going to work just fine. Let me just make sure, wrap that in parentheses, and we should see all those different errors go away, and my ID is just a string value like I expect. So again, this is something the code mob will take care of for us, but it's something that you need to be aware of because this is a pretty big difference between the original Next.js to the new Next.js, but I understand the reason why they do it, and again, it's to help with the actual rendering of your page to make it faster. Now, the next big major change is going to be related to how caching works. Everybody hated the cache in Next.js 14. It was way over aggressive and it made things incredibly hard to work with. And honestly, it made me kind of leave Next.js for quite a while. I really didn't want to work in it, but the new changes in Next.js 15 really make Next.js caching so much better. 
So essentially what they've done is they pulled back the caching to make it so it caches way less by default. So fetches, for example, they no longer cache them by default. This was the biggest change almost everyone was talking about because it made it incredibly difficult to work with your application when everything was cached by default. So they've made it so that instead of being forced cache by default, it is no store by default. So it's no longer going to store your information in a cache. But if you want to fall back to that old way of doing things, you can just throw this forced cache on here and it'll work essentially just like Next.js did before. I like this change a lot because now you can fine tune exactly what you want to be cached and what you don't instead of Next.js just blanketly caching literally everything you do. If you look down here, they essentially say all the different ways you can opt back into caching if that's what you want to do. And essentially it's the opposite of how you opt out of caching. So normally you would use these to opt out of caching, but now you can use them to opt into caching, which in my opinion is a much better approach. Caching should almost always be opt in instead of opt out because if you opt out of it or you don't know that you need to opt out of it, it can lead to tons of bugs. Now they also made it so that Git route handlers are no longer cached. I have no idea why anyone in Next.js thought caching API routes was a good idea, but by default, all of your Git API routes were cached. This is a horrible idea. So now they've rolled that back so that these are no longer cached by default. So honestly, this section about the caching is literally all they did is just fix all the things that I think were horrible in Next.js 14, which is really nice. It makes it so much easier to work with. And finally, this one was by far my biggest complaint with Next.js is the client router. This is a level of caching inside of Next.js where they'll kind of cache what the page looks like. So when you go from one page to another page and then back to the old page, it'll keep a cache in there. Essentially what was happening is if you had a dynamically rendered page, so for example, this page takes in a parameter that's an ID, you obviously think this is a dynamic page. It should re-render from the server every single time. But in Next.js, they actually were caching that for, I want to say 30 seconds by default. So every dynamic page was cached for 30 seconds on the client. So if you were to make a change and go back to that page, it was giving you the cached version. This was incredibly annoying to work around. It was difficult to actually make your code work properly. So they again rolled that back completely and they made it so the default time is zero. So it'll cache everything for zero seconds. And if you want to, you can go into the Next.js config and change this to get back to the original caching way that they had for things before. But again, it's not something that I enjoy. I don't know why anyone would want it. So I'm really glad that they rolled back all these caching changes. Essentially, they just made it so it's much more obvious what is cached by default. And for the most part, almost nothing gets cached by default. Now, if we work our way through this a little bit further here, we get to React 19. A really nice thing about Next.js is they kind of use newer versions of React than you can even use with normal React. So they're using React 19. And if we actually go into the package JSON, you can see here they're directly using the release candidate versions of React 19. So it's using essentially kind of beta features of React. But a lot of these features are really nice. I have a whole video talking about React 19. I'll link it in the cards and description that goes over all these different changes, but just know that you can use React 19 with Next.js if you want. Now, if we kind of scroll past all that stuff, you can see here React Compiler. That's again, part of React 19. That's in that video I talked about over there. Now, another improvement that they made to the development experience is they made it a little bit easier to see where hydration errors occur. So sometimes when you're working with your code, you get an error that essentially says, hey, there's a hydration error because your UI that you render from the server is not the same as what React is rendering on the client. Usually that means you have something kind of going wrong inside your code. So they just kind of changed that so that you can actually see what's going on in your source code. So instead of just seeing the rendered output, it's gonna show you the source code of where that happened to make it a little bit easier to see exactly where that error is coming from, which is nice because these are actually kind of difficult bugs to debug when they come up. Now, another major change that they're doing is they're adding in support for Turbo Pack. So Turbo Pack is like Next.js's thing where they're like, hey, we have this really fast compiler that's going to compile up all your code, transpile everything incredibly fast. And by default, Turbo Pack is disabled inside your project. But if you want to use Turbo Pack, all you do is just add the dash dash turbo flag, just like this, and that's going to use Turbo Pack. And Turbo Pack, they say is stable and working fine. And when I tested with Turbo Pack, I found that it was essentially as fast as they were saying. It was quite a bit faster on my computer to use Turbo Pack than it was to use just the normal compiler that they had built into Next.js. And actually, when you create a brand new Next.js 15 project, you can opt into using Turbo Pack by default if you want. But right now, if you want to just do it on a normal project, just add dash dash turbo, and that should hopefully increase the speed that you actually render out your application. Now, again, this is only for development, so it's not gonna make your site faster in production, but it will make your development experience more enjoyable. Now, another thing to help with the static route and caching problem is they added an indicator to every page that's static. So if we look at this page right here, I'll zoom in massively, you can see that at the very bottom of my page, I have this thing that just says static route indicator, just like that. So now you know exactly which pages are being statically rendered versus which ones aren't. And if you want to remove this, you can just click this X right here and it'll remove it for a set period of time, just so you don't have to see it on every single page if you're like testing things. But I like that because now it makes it easier for me to know, is this page static? Is it dynamic? And if I see that little static indicator on my page, 
I can say, okay, why is this static if I think it's supposed to be dynamic? And it helps debugging a little bit. Otherwise, you'd have to build your entire project to figure out what was static. Now I can actually see in development which is static and which is dynamic. Now this next feature is an experimental one, but I'm pretty excited about it. And that is the unstable after feature. And essentially the entire reason why you would want to do this is a lot of times inside of an application, you may have a server that's going to render out some information and then you want to do some like logging to a server. Maybe you want to send out like an email to some admins if there was an error that happened. You want to do some additional information, but you don't want the client who's requesting your website to wait for these things to happen because they're background tasks like logging or sending out an email to an admin. They're things that do not matter for the client. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to run code after it sends all the information down to the individual clients. So this is just going to help speed up your code. So if you're normally doing logging or this emailing stuff in your application, now with this new experimental feature, you can actually offload that so that happens after the request is sent, which makes your pages feel faster while still getting the exact same benefit. If we take a look at the code for it, it's relatively simple. You just need to enable the actual feature. And then you can see here, you can just use this after function. It's actually called unstable after they just renamed it and then put whatever code you want inside of here. And that is just going to run after your entire thing is finished rendering out all of the components and so on inside your application, again, to make your application feel faster. Now, this next feature, I'm just going to skip because essentially all this is doing is allowing you to hook into like low level Next.js lifecycle server methods. This is more so if you're doing like some more low level stuff, like a library author, not something you're probably ever going to mess with. The next thing I want to talk about is the form component. Now, obviously, if you're using like React hook form or some other form library, you're probably going to have a form component that you're going to use. But the form component inside Next.js is for one specific use case. It's not for every single form. It's specifically when you want to take a form in your application and have it render out to another page. If we look here, this is a perfect example. You can see we have a search form that's going from this current page to a slash search page. And this is a page inside your application. And we want to pass along whatever query. So really it's like you have a search page is the most common use case. You type in some information, you hit enter and it redirects you to the search results page. And it's going to pre-populate that query inside of your search params. I've actually gone ahead and I've created that exact same file in our application. So we can just go to slash form just like that. And now you can see I have this submit button and I have an input where I can pass in some information. And when I click submit, it's going to bring me to this search page and it's going to pass in the query. Now I did make one problem with my code. This is called query, not Q. So let me just rename that and we'll actually see the code show up. There we go. So now you can see whatever I searched is showing up right there on the page. Now, the reason this form component is so nice is because normally when you wanted to do this inside of Next.js 14, you would either have to write a lot of custom code or you would just have to do a full page refresh because the way Next.js works is that you do client navigation. So whenever I click on a link, it's not actually requesting all the stuff from the server and getting all the new HTML. It's staying on the exact same page. And what it's doing is it's only swapping out the things that change. It's keeping all the other stuff to make your page feel faster. That's what this new form is doing. It's making it so that it's now doing client side navigation between these two and it's going to populate all your search params for you. Essentially, it's just making forms work inside Next.js like you want them to if you're doing this particular type of form where you're navigating to another page inside your application. So this is a rather niche use case because again, it only works if you're navigating inside of one form to an actual another page. Otherwise, you really don't need this. But what it helps with is it's going to prefetch that new page to make it load faster. It's going to do that client side navigation. And again, it's going to be progressively enhanced. So it works even if your JavaScript hasn't loaded yet. Now, this does not mean you should replace all your forms with this form component. Again, only do it if you're navigating from one page to another page specifically as the action of your form. Now, the next thing that we want to talk about is the Next.js config now has TypeScript support. And you can see here by default, when I created a new project, it created this with a TypeScript type, which is nice if you're doing TypeScript, it just makes it a little bit nicer. We also have some improvements for self-hosting. Honestly, Next.js has always been kind of a pain to self-host. So hopefully this will help at least a little bit with the self-hosting, but I still imagine it's probably not super great because they're not super incentivized to make it easy to self-host because Vercel makes their money from people hosting Next.js applications. But at least it looks like they're trying to help a little bit, but I haven't really messed with this, but I imagine it's probably still not perfect. Now, one thing that a lot of people talk about that I don't really think is that big of a change is this enhanced security for server actions. Server actions are essentially a public API. Every time you create a server action, it creates a brand new public API. And the problem is that a lot of people don't realize that this code is public. So they maybe don't write their server actions super securely, or they don't realize that people can just call these server actions however they want to. So the way that they try to help with this a little bit inside of Next.js is first of all, if you have a server action defined, but you don't actually use it in your project, they just don't deploy that, which is nice because now you're not deploying code you don't need. And they also are adding these secure action IDs. So let me show you exactly what that looks like. We're just gonna create a brand new folder called actions. And inside of here, we're gonna create a brand new server action. Whoops, server action.ts. 
So to create a server action, we just need to put use server at the top of the file. And then we need to export an async function. We'll just call this test and we'll just have it return high. It really doesn't matter what this server action does. Now, inside of our form, we'll just use that server action instead. So we called that test. There we go, we're getting that from our action. And let's just make sure we use a normal form here because again, we're not doing any of the fancy things where we need a specific form for, so we could just use a normal form. And actually, I don't even need my action to return anything. I'll just console log so we know we've gone to this by just saying hi, and that'll clean up any errors that I have. So now you can see that I have this form. And if I go back to that form page, and I click the submit button, it's going to call this test action. And if we open up here inside of my console, you can see it prints out high every single time that I click on this button. So if we inspect our console here, we go to the network tab, we can actually see exactly what's happening. I'll click the submit button, make this full screen for you, click on form, and now you can see that there's this giant section called action ID. And this action ID is something that's unique to every single action. So every single action you have is gonna have its own action ID, which makes it a little bit harder for people to actually abuse the fact that your server actions are public. And if we look at the actual code, you can see the way they're doing this is they just have a hidden input with that particular action ID. Another thing that they're doing with these actions IDs is they're actually making sure they're periodically recalculated to change them. So that way, hopefully your application won't just be using the same action ID the entire time. It'll periodically change itself which makes it a little bit harder for people to abuse the fact that this is a public API, but all these changes don't change anything. And that's because the code is public, it's publicly accessible, so it doesn't matter how hard you make it to access, security through obscurity is not actually security. That's a saying that a lot of people should know, and that's because if you just make something hard to actually see, it doesn't make it actually secure. People that are dedicated and want to abuse this will abuse it, so I wouldn't really care much about these changes. If you're working with server actions, do your best to make sure that they are secure and that you know that they are publicly accessible. This next thing is essentially just an optimization to help with your application cold start speed, not really something that you need to worry about. And then finally, we have ESLint 9 support. So ESLint 8 is no longer supported. It's at end of life. So they allow you to actually use ESLint 9 if you want to. By default, it still uses ESLint 8 as the actual thing. So if we look inside our package JSON, you can see here ESLint 8. But if you want, you can upgrade to ESLint 9 and Next.js 15 will support that. Now, if we look inside of here, there's quite a few changes to make your development a little bit faster. Same thing here. This is to help with your build times to make them faster. Same thing here. We have some more stuff. This is not about anything to do with speed, but this is actually to help you get finer control over the static generation. But this is not something I would recommend messing with unless you really need to mess with it because it's experimental, first of all, and it's super fine grained control that you probably don't need for most applications. Now, there's a ton of other changes listed inside of here, but there's one that I'm surprised they didn't mention. It's in the improvements section right here. When you use Create Rec Next App, it's actually now going to ignore all ENV files by default. So if I were to create a file called .env, it's actually going to make sure it puts this inside my git ignore. You can see that has been grayed out. And if we look inside the git ignore and we look for env, you can see it's ignoring all git env, .env files. This used to not be the case. It used to not ignore these, which made it really easy to accidentally commit things like your database URL if you're using something like Drizzle that uses the .env file by default. Now, I know that was a rapid fire list of all the different changes to Next.js 15, but if you want to actually master Next.js 15 and really learn everything you need to know about it, I highly recommend checking out my Next.js course. I'm currently in the process of updating it from Next.js 14 to Next.js 15, and those updates will be entirely for free. So if you get the course right now while it's at Next.js 14, all the Next.js 15 updates will come to you for free as soon as I'm done with them. So again, if you're interested in that, I'll have a link down in the description. With that said, thank you very much for watching and have a good day.